Running Minute. I'm Teresa Longo, your host this week, and I'm joined here by KWG Resources CEO, Frank Smink. Good morning, Frank. Good morning, Teresa. Now, I've noticed something different about KWGresources.com, a complete overhaul of the website. It's a vibrant, dynamic website, which means it's compatible on phones and computers. It's very beautiful. Mm. It's a great website. Um, tell us about that. Thank you for the uh, for, for noticing and, and for the compliments. A little bit of a story, um, you know. We have very we've talked about this, and in fact, we do this uh, these mining minutes to a fairly big audience of uh, of active shareholders, um, bloggers, by and large, and uh, and others. And going back some time, uh, we we engaged a number of uh, individuals uh, from that audience, and one of them. Um, has become uh, a contract uh, consultant for us. Um, Stephen Pitcock is his name. He's an enormously talented uh, computer literate uh, web person, really, I don't, is the best way to call him. Yeah. And, and he suggested, you know, there's uh, what, what uh, it, this was mutual uh, admiration almost, uh, but he suggested uh, this story is so uh, multi layered and, and r relatively complex, and you've done um, uh, a lot of work in putting things together and educating. Um, the public, but it's not uh, easily uh, found or digested. So let me put a website together for you that uh, that makes it easy. He's collaborated with Bruce Hodgman and uh, Mo Levine in particular um, over the last uh, number of weeks and uh, more intensely the last uh, few days. And uh, I don't think it's all up th yet, but um, we should be finished pretty soon. And, and they've organized it in a way uh, by subject and then within each subject, uh, all, uh, you know, uh, connections to all of the underlying data. It tells a story. It really does. And I encourage everybody to go and visit the new website at kwgresources.com. Good. Thanks. So I get so many questions, but one of the questions I've been receiving a lot lately is about Firestarter. Oh, yeah. A lot of people want to know about Firestarter. It's the feature-length documentary about the historic Ring of Fire and all the players involved. So when are we going to get to when see is, that? Uh, or? Uh, soon, um, I hope. Um, so, so the story is, uh, it was um, the, the filmmaker was an initiative of Jamie Bailey's and um, we're delighted he chose uh, the, the subject that he did because it gave us an opportunity to uh, to tell the story. I, you know, an important piece of Canadian history, I think, uh, as we will perhaps better understand in the future. Um, and uh, Jamie submitted that uh, to uh, to the jury of the Toronto International Film Festival uh, in the hope that uh, it would be selected for. Uh, um, by the festival um, in in that category, and uh, unfortunately, um, it wasn't, and so uh, we're now working on Plan B. I, I, as it as it's coming together, there will be a, a screening, an official launch of it at some time. Uh, in the meantime, um, uh, hopefully, in the not too distant future. In the meantime, we're looking at uh, distribution alternatives. Um, the the official launch uh, to us represents an opportunity for some of the uh, people making this history, uh, First Nations in particular, and um, you know people that uh, got a lot of uh, time in the film, if you will, uh, the Wildlands League, um, the uh, Chief Day of the um, Ontario Chiefs, um, amongst others. We're seeing if it wouldn't make sense to them. And, and some, a few others uh, to be patrons of this uh, uh, documentary and um, uh, have that uh, patronage uh, perhaps uh, bring more attention to the film uh, when it uh, when it is released. So that's the current you plan. Tell us about the Copper Lake project and Bold Ventures. Sure, our principal uh, chromite uh, development is uh, the option under which. Um, Bold Ventures is earning 50% uh, uh, joint venture interest from FanCamp. It was our responsibility to make the expenditures on behalf of Bold in order to earn 80% uh, of Bold's interest. Um, that's simplifying uh, really what is a relatively complicated deal. Um, the, uh, the, so the Copper Lake project is, is the group of four claims originally staked by uh, by by Richard Nemus, actually, and then an option to FanCamp. 
and uh, then uh, FanCamp in turn optioned them to Bold Ventures. Um, we in turn optioned the, the right to be the operator from uh, Bold Ventures. Um, there was a need to communicate um, and need to understand um, amongst the three of us uh, coming into uh, the, the end of the time within which we had to uh, spend uh, a total of $8 million in the, in the first phase. And, and that's, that's to do that on behalf of Bold for them to earn that, to, to actually create the joint venture um, in a 50-50 uh, JV with, uh, with FanCamp. Um, and that took a little bit of time and, and a little bit of give and take around, uh, around the table. And we needed to serve notice that uh, you know, we, we had agreed to extend the time so that everybody had a few extra days to um, go through the details of what we suggested uh, um, was value that should be uh, recognized um, in our in our programs, and and this includes the uh, the uh, investments that we've made in the uh, China Rail uh, FSDI feasibility study, as well as the uh, uh, gas reduction uh, IP uh, intellectual property. So uh, it got what time consuming, but um, after a few days uh, beyond that, uh, midnight of Friday. Uh, uh, we were able to uh, come to terms and uh, put out a press release that, uh, in fact, the joint venture has been created. And I, I couldn't be happier for uh, all three of us. I think it's just wonderful. Thanks. So today, the question for you is about Martin Falls. And give me some new updates about that situation right now. All right. They, uh, Martin Falls with uh, Arrowland issued a press release uh, a number of days ago indicating that they are working together on uh, transportation options. Um, for the development of the Ring of Fire and uh, confirming their um, their jurisdiction, their sovereignty in the traditional lands, and uh, so that that's kind of uh, revived the issue. We've we've also heard uh, directly and indirectly that, um, uh, in fact, it was referred to by Chief Bruce Achnipanaskam of Martin Falls in in that uh, press release and interview uh, following on the on the press release that they're, uh, they're concerned about uh, the work we're doing on the mining claims, uh, our, our so-called railroad mining claims, which were uh, staked by our subsidiary Canada Chrome Corporation. Chief Echnipanescom indicated uh, you know, that he didn't think that we were doing uh, mining work on them and was concerned that we're using them uh, to develop a transportation option. As I've indicated to uh, all three chiefs, uh, Chief Toledo in Arrowland, Chief uh, Echnipanescom in Martin Falls, and Chief uh, Cornelius Wabas in Webequay. We, what we are doing is getting ourselves ready to give them um, uh, comprehensive information um, where we can share with them a plan that is uh, potentially feasible, uh, subject to them uh, being in agreement with it, and subject to uh, the uh, capital markets um, being sufficiently in agreement with it to finance it. Um, the financing won't come without the agreement of the First Nations and, the, and the, the, the plan won't go anywhere without the agreement of the First Nations. So it's, um, I, I, I think it's frustrating, you know, when, when like all of us, when, when, you, when you don't know um, what's going on, you, you fear the worst. But um, I thought I had articulated our idea um, adequately to Martin Falls and Webequay, or at least to the leadership of Martin Falls and Webequay, uh, that, look, there's no point in, in us, uh, talking about anything unless we have a, you know, a plan. And the only plan that is of any value is one that uh, the banks would look at it, uh, for purposes of financing. And that actually is the main background and, and the principal reason of why, uh, why we engaged uh, China Railway uh, First Survey and Design Institute. They are preparing this feasibility study um, for uh, the use of uh, Chinese banks to determine project financing criteria uh, and terms. And so once we have that uh, complete, hopefully by the end of the year or very early in, in uh, 2017, we, we plan to share that with all of the First Nations that are affected, but the principal ones uh, that this uh, transportation corridor goes through is, is Martin Falls and Webequay. And um, we'll share it with them at that time so that they can, they can digest it and come to their own, uh, come to, you know, 
come to an informed opinion as to what what they'd like to do or what uh, what their communities um, uh, would like to do or not do and following that process we our view is that we can then engage in in, uh, in fully informed consultation with those two with those two communities where on earth did kwg get the idea to have a hyperlink built to the ring of fire oh very good question um we are a creature of the capital markets. Junior exploration companies have no income and so uh, survive only if they can raise risk capital to pursue their dreams. And so we pay attention to uh, what's going on in the capital markets. Stories uh, in New York and London is um, yet another of um, uh, the famous Elon Musk uh, uh, inventions or brain ch brain uh, brainchilds. Um, it, which is the hyperlink or the hyperloop, as as it's called, and uh, this is being pursued in uh, in uh, an incubator in uh, in Southern California that has raised a lot of money and came to the attention of the capital markets in the last few weeks when another very successful um, stock market darling lost its, its chief uh, financial officer to uh, Hyperloop One, and. Um, I can't remember the man's name, but he, he raised um, uh, many hundreds of millions of dollars, a few billion dollars for Uber. And that, of course, gets, uh, gets the attention of the people on Wall Street, especially. And his move over to um, Hyperloop One brought the whole concept to our attention. And so one thing, one thing led to another, and we uh, actually met with a couple of professors at the um, uh, University of Toronto Engineering School encouraged us to to in an idea that had been formulated by uh, a very astute investment banker friend of mine that we may be uh, the best situation in the world uh, to uh, to create what's called in, in uh, you know new technology a proof of concept because um, the, the hyperloop idea is to move people in in pneumatic tubes um, low atmosphere, tubes at a very fast speed uh, in populated areas. So like from uh, Toronto to Montreal in 30 minutes, uh, the leading uh, contender is uh, Los Angeles to San Francisco again in uh, 30 minutes or something like that. But the problem with those uh, uh, situations is the, um, the right-of-way um, is, is almost impossible to secure for, for love nor money uh, because they're very, very dense, very populated, very highly built areas. So our right of way, the the famous uh, Ring of Fire um, uh, claims in Canada Chrome Corporation, from the Ring of Fire down to Nikina, um, is bought and paid for, and it's quite flat, and it's tectonically stable, and uh, it may be the ideal place to uh, prove the concept of this um, pneumatic tube to transport, in our case, not people, but uh, chromite ore, and it may um, it may be. Um, no more costly and much more environmentally friendly and much more interesting uh, to use a, a pneumatic tube with uh, with uh, cigars full of ore in them uh, going back and forth. The the technology as it has advanced is um, what's, what's called linear induction. So magnetic uh, motor that's pushing the, pushing the thing that's resisting it on, on, on a linear basis. So it can go in either direction. And uh, our idea is not to have a loop, but rather have a link that, that goes one way or the other, and then they can cross in the middle. And what a revolutionary idea that is, Frank. It looks like it, yeah. I think uh, but it, it's, um, it, it, there seems to be enthusiasm. There's certainly enthusiasm to, um, to develop the Ring of Fire, there's, but there's enthusiasm for the North, and there's a, obviously anything that's environmentally uh, benign or, or, in fact, friendly. Uh, lots of enthusiasm for that. And now uh, Wall Street, uh, you know, has enthusiasm for, for Hyperloop technologies. So. Thanks, Frank. You're welcome. See you next week. Okay. Mining Minute. I'm your host, Teresa Longo, joined here today by KWG Resources CEO, Frank Smink. Thanks for taking the time today, Frank. Always a pleasure. Lately, we've been talking about a potential hyperlink to the Ring of Fire in Northern Ontario. What are some of the potential ancillary opportunities associated with a hyperlink? Well, uh, the first is uh, the uh, relationship, um, the, the symbiotic relationship with China. Um, as we've uh, noted before, China 
consumes about two thirds of the world's uh, ferrochrome uh, t because they produce about two thirds of the world's stainless steel. So um, we've uh, noted before that it, that they China must be a customer uh, for this uh, Canadian ring of fire chromite. Otherwise, uh, it's going to be a very big uphill battle. We we've um, uh, coincident with uh, starting in on this technology, we did uh, suggest to um, to our friends in China that there was an opportunity uh, both in the building uh, and engineering of the hyperlink, but also in the manufacture of the actual tube itself um, to um, uh, to joint venture uh, some, some significant uh, uh, business opportunities there, um, you know, making, making the tube out of it, that they will almost certainly be made out of stainless steel. Uh, so uh, that that's something for the likes of Bow Steel, and um, they uh, then our friends at uh, uh, China Railway uh, for Survey and Design Institute. Uh, they they know how to build things across um, all kinds of terrain, and um, putting a tube on top of some pilings, I think, is uh, well within their uh, their grasp, and uh, they 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 could be. Um, could be very interesting to a joint venture, you know, construction methods for for something like this particular hyperlink, at least this kind of hyperlink, a freight uh, bulk commodity hyperlink. Um, the other one is, uh, in our case, uh, you know, you end up in a place w with very small population, which uh, for much of the year is very very cold, uh, but um, it's the kind of pristine wilderness that. Uh, People in the the, the humongous uh, cities of the of the of the world uh, would love to come and, and and be able to go and see. So one of one of the opportunities we're looking at is putting a uh, a rail on top of the tube, a single rail, and running very light uh, monorail, uh, you know, small uh, capacity monorail trains um, up to the Ring of Fire, and perhaps. Uh, Perhaps we can have our own competition amongst the ice hotels of the uh, of the uh, of the Scandinavian states, and um, maybe build some uh, ice hotels and ice casinos as a destination to go to because they'll they'll stay cold there for a long time. Michael, a question I have for you: Has the Liberal government given you any t indication of a timeline regarding the development of Ontario's Ring of Fire? Well, other than indicating that they're developing a plan to implement a plan to put a plan into action. They have not, and unfortunately, that's what a lot of industry and municipal leaders and First Nations are indicating that they're frustrated with is what's happening and what's the next step because nobody seems to know what the answer to that question is. Absolutely no indication whatsoever. No, they're going to their indication, uh, respecting, and of course, we all understand the relationships with First Nations have to be developed, and we will progress as fast as First Nations uh, can get the information uh, that they're looking for. That they engage with the companies, but no indication whatsoever as far as the time frame, an engagement process, or how this is going to move, or when it's going to move forward. How would Canada benefit if the Ring of Fire were to be developed in a way that was economically and environmentally conscious as well? Well, first and foremost would be an opportunity for First Nations to build their own capacity and get the revenue streams that they're looking for in order to build their communities up, answer questions about housing, jobs, economic development, but also for everybody else in this province, we're looking at a once-in-a-lifetime deposit uh, of chromite that is in the Ring of Fire and the other minerals that are yet to be explored or to, to be developed in that entire area. So the opportunities are endless. You know, the, the sooner we can get to this, along respecting all of the stakeholders involved, involving First Nations, involving municipalities, bringing in everybody into one umbrella to having a wholesome discussion is the quickest opportunity that we're going to get to develop this so that we can reap the benefits across this country as far as the resources that are going to come out of there and the opportunities for new jobs. And why might the Ontario government give little credibility to the international ferrochrome trade opportunity proposed by KWG Resources? I think a lot relies upon their lack of knowledge of what is actually being proposed by KWG and uh, we should be challenging ourselves as far as what Frank has done is go out and actually challenge the scientific community in order to develop not only a resource but a new way of delivering that resource to market. It's quite advanced uh, to be honest with you. It's very, uh, it's very thinking outside of the box. And uh, unfortunately, the problem is, is that the government is not willing 
to sit down and understand his entire process. So it's frustrating to seeing that where an individual has come in and spearheaded an opportunity or a new method of delivering a product, that the government is not challenging themselves as, as far as learning and getting comfortable with what that idea or what that avenue ask you about some of the differences between hyperlink versus the other options like rail or rail road um, slurry pipe um, so uh, to this point in time we've looked at uh, all three now we're looking at the fourth um, the slurry pipe goes in the ground uh, and it uses water so it disturbs it disturbs the right-of-way um, and it uh, has to go under the uh, under the natural drainage uh, rivers and streams um, and, uh, you know, if something happens, uh, it'll freeze and stop. Um, the railroad is uh, costly. It makes it, first you have to make a roadbed. Um, the uh, very boggy, wet areas, uh, it will be expensive to, um, to get down to bedrock and, and make, a, make a stable bed f to put the, put the rail and the, and the sleepers on. Um, and it makes a, uh, makes a long, linear passage, which... Uh, the, the moose and the wolves and, and uh, you know won't recognize it disturbs it disturbs the, uh, the the natural environment to the to some extent uh, not as much as a road a road you can just imagine it's um, got a lot more width and um, and substance than uh, than a railroad um, all of those things have to cross have to make in the case of this north south right of way uh, 98 water crossings um, so they're very costly to carry trucks or trains across, um, in the case of, uh, well, the Attawapiska River, I think, is 1,200 feet. Uh, in the case of uh, the Albany River, uh, 600 feet. Uh, these, are, these are big bridges. They're very, very costly. The, the hyperlink tube, um, it appears, it can, be, can be in the air, um, supported uh, on pylons. And uh, um, a single pylon is relatively uh, uncomplicated uh, to, to anchor in bedrock. The bedrock along this right-of-way isn't that far down. Uh, we established that with the, uh, with the uh, drilling program that we did in the, uh, what, for, after staking, uh, staking the claims. And um, so it, 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 it doesn't disturb the surface or the, or the natural drainage. Um, there will be some uh, disturbing done when when the uh, construction is underway but it can that you know the pylons being installed the surrounding landscape can be returned to its natural state so uh, the uh, the uh, wildlife in particular uh, will will recognize it as it as it was um, and and it shouldn't interfere with uh, the habitat uh, it'll be much 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 less interference with the habitat those are the those are the uh, trade-offs, if you will, that we've. Uh, and what about ones. what about the cost? So, what would a cost of a hyperlink be versus, say, railway? It would appear to be close and and competitive, um, you know, and that's that's just uh, an educated wild yeah, guess. The, the, there are numbers of in different um, in different parts of the world uh, for the cost of construction of different systems. Our system may be um, substantially less costly because we think we, we expect we'll use a smaller diameter pipe um, than uh, what you would need to uh, use a pipe to transport people in in uh, in a conveyance. Uh, if you're conveying a bulk uh, bulk commodity uh, like uh, chromite, uh, you know, three inch pieces of chromite, um, that pipe doesn't need to be that big to to get the volume from the north to the south. And with the positive environmental impacts versus the other option, I'm glad that KWG Resources is interested in exploring that. Well, thank you. In this episode, I will speak with KWG Resources VP of Exploration and Development, Mo Levine. Mo joins us via satellite this week to talk to us about the progress made since his trip to the University of Minnesota Duluth. Mo, talk to us about progress that KWG Resources has made since you visited the Coleraine Minerals Research Lab. Good morning, Teresa. Uh, what I'd like to talk to you about today is the, uh, the development of our gas reduction of chromite. As I mentioned last week, uh, we engaged uh, a lab that belongs to the University of Minnesota in Coleraine to start doing some te test work. I'd like to report now that uh, they have finally succeeded in uh, producing ferrochrome at, at a lab scale. And the purpose of doing uh, this lab scale work is to 
create the, the parameters that we need to do the full pilot scale. It's our expectation that uh, the lab scale testing will, will be completed soon and that uh, before Christmas uh, we'll be in a position to conduct a commercial scale test on the, the linear hearth furnace that they have at uh, Coleraine. So that's a bit of good news. So now we have uh, two different labs that have produced uh, ferrochrome carbide using our method. We now have a third lab because CANMET, which is a metallurgical lab that belongs to the federal government, they've been doing research on chromite for nearly a couple of years now. So the, this summer, uh, they successfully produced ferrochrome carbide using our method, and they uh, revealed those results uh, near the end of, of September. And they were spectacular. They uh, produced ferrochrome carbide crystals much larger than the ones we had produced at XPS. And uh, the size of the, the crystals is important because the larger the crystals are, the easier it will be for us to separate them from the waste minerals. And that's why uh, uh, we're going to continue to do test work uh, in Coleraine over the life of this project because we're constantly going to be optimizing uh, the variables such that we can grow the biggest crystals possible. So even when we actually go into full production, the, the test work and uh, will continue, and that's the normal uh, life of a, of a smelter. Uh, the research never stops. Thanks for joining us this week, Mo. KWG Resources participation in hyperlink technology. How does one go about participating in that? Well. We, uh, I did mention also that uh, the, the, the incubator of this technology and uh, the leading, uh, the one that's raised a lot of capital to pursue it is a company called Hyperloop One um, in uh, Southern California. Hyperloop One, for the last uh, many months, has been conducting a worldwide um, uh, competition for um, the submission of proposals for the use of the technology. It's very astute of them. It's uh, reminiscent of uh, what Rob McEwen did the uh, early days of Gold Corp when he opened up the database um, at the Campbell Red Lake Mine and, and to every geologist in the world and said, uh, tell me where the rest of the gold is and uh, you win a prize. And it was quite a prize, I think half a million dollars. In this case, the prize is your project gets chosen uh, to, be, uh, to be promoted as uh, one of uh, perhaps three of the leading contenders for the for the practical use of, um, of a um, hyperloop or hyperlink uh, technology. It was short notice when we started to pay attention because uh, the, the contest had uh, been out for a long time, but we quickly learned that uh, there were proposals coming from everywhere in the world, I think as many as 1,500, most of them, in fact, by um, government and private industry consortia. As I mentioned, we met with... Uh, Dr. Cameron Bedenan at the University of Toronto Engineering School. Uh, he's actually the chair of the um, Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada. Uh, so he, he was the right guy. And he encouraged us. He's been an idea which has been around for a long, long time, but uh, it, uh, many of the problems have been solved. There's still issues that remain to be dealt with, but it is, uh, it's getting close to, to being uh, practical. Um, the cost would be another factor, but... So, um, with uh, his assistance and uh, the assistance of a couple of uh, postgraduate students, um, uh, we put our proposal together and submitted it before the deadline of uh, at midnight last Friday. And uh, so that's the beginning. We'll see. You know, heaven forbid, we uh, we should be one of the three that win. But but our, ours is a very interesting application, as I said. It's uh, because we have a high value commodity that can actually pay a substantial m amount of freight which is what makes the cost of it make common sense. So. I'm your host, Teresa Mondo. In this episode, I'll talk to KWG Resources VP of Exploration and Development, Mo Levine, about his recent trip to the University of Minnesota Duluth. On behalf of KWG Resources, he visited the Coleraine Minerals Research Lab. Mo, thanks for being here this week. Good morning, Teresa. Tell me about your trip to the University of Minnesota. I'm here at the Coleraine Mineral Research Facility, uh, which is part of the University of Minnesota in uh, Coleraine, which is in the middle of the Iron Ranges here in central Minnesota. The reason I'm here is that this particular facility has done a lot of work in the past and in fact have developed 29 patents associated with the direct reduction of iron. 
they have a lot of test furnaces and they also have a lot of pilot scale furnaces that we're going to be able to use to commercialize the direct reduction of chromite to ferrochrome. Uh, so today begins uh, the first round of discussions and planning the test work that's going to take place here quite possibly for a, a number of years. Thanks for being with us today, Mo. Thanks for watching the Mining Minute. We'll see you next week. What are you doing to maximize the value of KWG resources in the eyes of shareholders today? Well, in the eyes of shareholders, uh, including myself, the only the only eyes that matter is the uh, the price of the stock, and that's that's what we we're all looking at. We're getting close to the point where China Rail feasibility study is uh, is is in the final stages now. I, I've been told it will be made available to us by the end of the year, and then that will start a process of um, meeting with the uh, banks in China to uh, hopefully arrange uh, project finance for the construction of the railroad and perhaps uh, for the construction of the of the mine and the uh, reduction plant as well. Um, as that uh, moves along, I think that the company becomes more of a, a takeover uh, target uh, from from the perspective of um, investors, uh, private equity investors. Uh, so uh, we we are looking at uh, opportunities to structure that um, in the best way possible. We we continue to need money and uh, to to get that we have to issue shares, but. I think once the project financing uh, gets put together, then um, we can liquidate um, some of the value of uh, the, some of the prior investment in the railroad asset in particular, then use that as our working capital for the next number of years. Then the, then the company becomes very, very attractive if it is underpriced um, to, uh, to be acquired by investors who are prepared to take it private and uh, pay whatever price they have to to the shareholders that own it now. Uh, to do that and um, uh, see it through the next many number of years uh, while the railroad and the mine gets built and the whole plan gets put together. Thank you, Frank. You're welcome. So this completes Season 1 of the Mining Minute. Please be sure to watch Episodes 1 through 50, and we'll see you in Season 2. Look forward to it.